Our passage this morning is John chapter 5. We're looking at verses 31 through 47. And the title of the message this morning is Believe the Son. Believe the Son. And this is part two as we've been working through these verses from verse 31 to 47, looking at the fourfold witness of Christ, looking at the witness of Christ. And again in John's gospel, as we get into our text, we come once again to this recurring theme of witness in John's gospel. Jesus Christ here in John chapter 5 is bearing witness of himself. He bears witness of himself. John the Baptist has borne witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I have a greater witness. The works that I do bear witness of me. So his works bear witness to Jesus. And today we're going to see more witnesses to Christ in this glorious passage. John the evangelist, as we walk through this, is lining up witnesses, and he's going to line up more witnesses throughout the gospel as we work throughout the entire gospel of John. Remember, he writes again so that we may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life in his name. So as he presents that purpose for writing, he's going to develop that and present witnesses to us from the words of God, the Holy Spirit working through him to present to us witnesses to Christ that we might believe. If you're here today and you've never believed in the Son of God, you've never turned from your sin to put your faith in him, there are tremendous evidences given, unquestionable evidences, undeniable evidence given for why you should believe. And in believing, have a life in the Lord Jesus Christ. No reason why anyone should die and spend an eternity in hell. There's no reason for it. There is tremendous evidence if we'll simply open our hearts and minds to what the Lord has to say in his word and cry out to God to give us understanding. Here, Jesus says in verse 34 that he says these things with the gracious purpose, with the compassionate purpose, right, of evangelism, of saving sinners. He says, he says these things that you may be saved. That salvation we know comes by grace through faith, grace through faith, through a saving belief in the Son of God. Often you see belief and faith synonymous in Scripture. They mean the same thing. But what does it mean to believe in the Son? What kind of response is expected from us with respect to these tremendous evidences that the Lord is presenting here of himself? Do you believe in the Son? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith through a saving belief in him. And it says, that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In presenting all these witnesses in John chapter 5, Jesus Christ, the Lord, is after a specific response. After a specific response, that response is saving faith in him, saving belief in the Lord. No other response will do. You think you'll make it to heaven on your own works? No other response is acceptable. Do you think that you'll make it because God is forgiving? That's what he does. No other response is acceptable. Do you think that you're going to make it by performing religious rituals, going to church, you know, going through the motions? No other response is acceptable but saving faith in Christ. No counterfeit will suffice. The only acceptable response is saving faith, belief in the Son. Now, many, many, many people today say they believe. It's easy to say that they believe. I I remember one person saying, thinking of Romans chapter 10, if you confess the Lord Jesus, you know, say with your mouth that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And he said, I could teach my parrot to say that my parrot is going to go to heaven because my parrot can say, I believe in Christ. Is that the response? Is that all there is to it? Is that what belief is in Scripture? Just being able to say, parrot the words? No other counterfeit, no other response will do. It's acceptable, saving faith in Christ. It's the only response that the Lord is after. According to a Gallup poll, 78% of Americans say they're Christians. 78% of those that live in our country say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, say that they're Christians. Within that group of those that say they believe in the Son, you have a whole bunch of CEOs, right? That's not of companies, that's Christmas, Easter only Christians. (laughs) Tons of CEOs. You have a bunch of ABCs, 
All they've done is admit, believe, and confess, and there's no R in there. There's no repentance. And they continue to live in their sin. You have a ton of people, out of those 78% of people in our country who say they're Christians, you have a bunch of LDVLs, living to Vida Loca, right? They're just living how they want to live, living the crazy life, you know, doing whatever they want to do, living like the devil and calling themselves Christians. And they go to mass the next morning, so everything's washed over, everything's okay, right? Is that how it works? They believe, many of these, in the same way that demons believe. And they live like the devil. Now you think about it. A demon has more evidence for his belief than you and I do. They've seen the Lord. They've seen the miracles. They can attest that all of this is true. And yet James says, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Do you have the belief or the faith of a demon? What does it mean, based on the evidence that the Lord provides, what does it mean to believe the Son? I witnessed to a young man at the campus this last week who said he believed. I was talking to him. He said he believed. He believed the Bible. He believed there were no errors in the Bible. Believed the Word of God. Believed wholeheartedly. Believed God. Believed heaven. Believed the miracles of Christ. Believed Christ. He said, I believe in the Son. I believe in Jesus Christ, and yet when we were talking, the thing that hung him up, that he could not come to grips with, that he could not believe, was that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, perfect life, would die for sinners. That's fundamental to the Christian faith. If you don't believe that, then you are rejecting the per person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you reject the Son, you reject the Father who sent him. It's impossible to be saved if we reject the Son, if you reject the person and work of the Son. Two guys you think about that say, I want to join the military. I believe in the cause of our military, so I want to join the military. Two guys say it. They both plan to go into the military. One of them, you talk to him and you ask him, why? Why do you want to go into the military? Uh, what's the purpose of you making that kind of a commitment? And he says, I want to travel the world. I want to travel the world. I want to see glamorous and picturesque ports of call. All my friends are going in, so I want to go in with them, right? I just think it sounds exciting, like to be on a boat. <laughs> so I want to go and I want to travel the world. And I want to, you get to hold a gun? Really excited about that? Just sounds cool. Besides, you get that really cool uniform, I, just, I think it's cool to every morning wake up and have shiny shoes and wear a uniform. You get to sing those songs like Anchors Away. And, I mean, it's just going to be a party like all the time. Yeah, going into the military. The recruiter says, now wait a minute, son. You need to understand here what you're signing up for. What are you signing up for? This guy just says, I don't care. Just sign me up, right? Sign me up. So he goes off and he joins the military. He goes to boot camp. He's like, wait a minute. What time do I have to get up? Yeah, I thought it was, we do more before 10 a.m. than most people do all day. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> up at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, how far do I have to run? What do I have to clean? What's a latrine? I've never heard of that before, right? And then he goes, you know, he's not going to obey any orders. He just lays his around the barracks, right? Waiting on the ship to set sail. And then he goes to his first picturesque, glamorous location. It's a desert in the Middle East. What in the world is this? This is not what I signed up for, right? Besides that, in the back of his shiny new uniform, he's got his gunny's boot print on the rear seat of his pants because he won't follow orders, won't do what he's supposed to. Is that guy, is, that, is his heart in it? Uh, there's something going on. That guy believes in a different way, believes in the cause of our military in a totally different way. He comes to grips really quickly with what's expected of him, though, when the bullets start flying. When the bullets start flying and he has to start following orders, he has to do what he's told, he comes to grips. Heart may not be in it because he had other expectations, but he grits it out and does what he's supposed to. Says he believes in the cause of our military. Then you have the second guy. The second guy says, you know what? I believe in the cause of our military. I want to join the military. He loves his country, vows to protect her against all enemies, foreign and domestic, because he believes in the cause, because he believes in the military, because he loves our country, he's willing to grit it out in the dirt, in the sand, in the 115 degree temperatures, willing to go out when the bullets are flying, willing to obey orders. 
you know, willing to do what the gunny says because he knows it's for his good and for his safety, for the good of the military, for the good of our cause. Willing to fight. In fact, he signed up knowing it could cost him his life because he believes in a way that the first guy didn't believe. Do you see? It's just a difference in the mindset, difference in the heart set, right? Difference between the two forms of belief here. Now, that's a lame analogy. You can't carry it too far, but you get the picture. There's a difference in the way that they view the cause, a difference in the way that they view their commitment, a difference in what their expectation is. But we have a greater retirement program than the military does, amen? Amen. And I'm not having to love that gunny and serve him with all my heart, soul, and strength. I get to love the Lord Jesus Christ who died for me. Amen? Far better cause to believe in. But you get the idea. What does it mean to believe in the Son? Now, many of us grew up in easy believism. Many come out of that. Whether you're Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Charismatic, Pentecostal, whatever, most of that, Catholicism, it's all one form or fashion or another of easy believism, seems like nowadays. Easy believism is another word for a theological term called antinomianism, made up of two Greek words, anti, which means against or instead of or no, and namas, meaning law. So it's instead of the law or against the law. Antinomianism, anti, antinomos, namas, meaning lawlessness. Now, many of you like me who grew up in that movement, we said that we believed. We testified with our lips that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet we were easy believers or antinomians, meaning that we lived lawlessly. Of those 78% in the Gallup poll that said they're Americans, or said that they believed in Christ, that they were Christians, a vast majority of those today that claim to be Christians are antinomians. They are lawless. They profess Christ with their mouths, but their hearts are far from him. They profess Christ with their testimony, and yet their lives look like the devil. They don't live for him. Is that belief in the Son? No. If you say that you believe in Christ, and yet you live lawlessly, you can't be saved. You are not saved. It's antinomianism, it's lawlessness. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I believe. Lord, Lord, I believe. But under that kind of belief, he's going to respond to us as Lord says in Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness, you live in a lawless way. It's a rejection of that kind of belief. The Lord rejects that kind of belief. The only kind of belief that is appropriate to the evidence that we find here in John chapter 5. Now think about it for a moment. The only response that is appropriate to the evidence that the Lord is giving us of himself in John chapter 5 is the entirety of your life. The entirety of your commitment. It is turning from sin, which offends God, and turning by complete faith, commitment, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that bears evidence in fruit, in service to him, in obedience to his commands. It's a belief that radically change, changes your life. It's a belief that consumes who you are for the Lord. It's a belief that turns you wholeheartedly to Christ. A belief that trusts Christ in every circumstance. It's a belief that trusts the entirety of who you are, all of your decisions, all of your desires, all of your hopes. It entrusts the entirety of who you are to who he is and what he has done and what he wants for you. It's a belief that bears the fruit of obedience rather than serving yourself. And you think about it now, that's the response of saving faith to Christ and who he is. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's walking through Jerusalem, the Judean countryside, Samaria, Galilee, and he is presenting evidence that he is God in the flesh, that he is God incarnate. That he is equal with the Father, united with the Father. That he is eternal as the Father is eternal. That he has life in himself, self-existent as the Father. Jesus Christ is God, your creator and my creator. And he is walking through the wilderness, the, the, the Hebrew countryside, so to speak, and he's giving evidence of that fact. 
the only response that is adequate or acceptable being that Jesus Christ the Lord is God, is our creator, God in the flesh is one of total belief, total commitment, encompassing all that you are. It's the only appropriate response to that fact, amen? And he's presenting evidence of this very thing. We've already seen examples of people believing in the Son, haven't we? As we walk through the Gospel of John, we saw Matthew. You know, Matthew leaves his tax table, stands up at the very call of Christ, forsakes all, and follows him whole, wholeheartedly from that day forward. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. What does Peter do? Peter leaves behind his fishing. The day that he's called, he forsakes all and follows Christ. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, some people might think, and often, often, often churches teach that you can become a Christian and at some point in the future, you'll begin following. Listen, that is an unbiblical theology that will lull you into a sense of peace with God all the way to hell. The fruit that you believe in the Lord, the fruit that you believe in Christ is that you live like it, that you bear fruit of that faith. Already we see many examples of those here who say they believe and yet don't believe. Remember those in Jerusalem at Passover week in John chapter 2. They said they believed because of the miracles that they saw, but they never got out of the barracks, right? They weren't going to put on the uniform. They weren't going to take bullets. They never followed. What are the Pharisees doing here? They're the enemy. They're firing bullets at the Lord Jesus Christ. They would say that they believe in the God of the Bible. They would say that they believe in the Messiah, but they're rejecting God's promised Messiah right here in this account. And the greatest purpose imaginable is given for this evidence. Here, the Lord presents evidence in John chapter 5, and the greatest purpose imaginable is given for that. It's so that you may know Christ, that you may be saved. Jesus says in verse 34, I say these things that you may be saved, that you might have life in his name. Now, every one of these in John chapter 5 that he's speaking to here, the Jewish opposition, are wicked rebels against him. Man, they are wicked rebels against him. Here Jesus Christ is giving this evidence and all the while they are seeking, plotting to kill him. Rebelling against him. They've already made up their minds. This testimony is garbage and we're not gonna accept it. They've rejected him in every way possible that you can reject him to the point that in the near future it's going to lead to his crucifixion. It's gonna lead to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And yet here he graciously condescends to make his case. Despite the hard-heartedness of man, despite the total depravity of man, he continues to give evidence and continues to make his case. Despite the utter rebellion of man, despite those that bear his name, that call themselves Christians, and yet speak his word like a curse word. Despite those that call themselves Christians and waste their weekends getting drunk, waste their weekends taking someone home with them right? Fornicators, adulterers, liars. These are the people that the Lord Jesus Christ is condescending to present evidence to so that they might be saved. Enemies of his by their wicked works. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ in grace and in mercy continues to pour on the evidence. So the obvious question is, will you believe him? Will you believe the son? This is great grace, great mercy, great compassion. If you do, if you're going to believe the Son, it's going to radically change your life. And wouldn't you want your life changed? Aren't you sick and tired of living under the weight of that sin? The way of the transgressor is hard. Turn to Christ and live. And trust me, it gets harder. On the authority of God's word, you'll live a hard life now, bearing the weight of your sin, and then you'll die and you'll go to hell. You're not living your best life now. Will you do it? What will you do with the evidence? In verse 31, as we studied last week, the Lord says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness isn't true to you, basically, he says. Jesus is not saying that his own witness is unreliable. It is completely, sufficiently reliable. But his opponents have already rejected that witness. They've called him a liar. And so then verse 32, he appeals to the Father's witness of him. He says, there's another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Now that witness, the witness of the Father, unquestionably conclusive for the Lord Jesus Christ, 
but he knows it's not going to be for his opponents. His opponents have already rejected that witness. If they reject the witness of the son, they reject the witness of the father. They reject the father out of hand. So in spite of that rejection that he's faced already, in spite of the opposition, in spite of their hostility, in spite of the plot to kill him, he again just sets up a line of witnesses. A line of witnesses so that hard-hearted rebels like you and I can be saved. We saw the witness of John last week, verses 33 through 35. We looked at the works of Christ in verse 36. Today, beginning point three on your notes, we'll look at the words of the Father in verses 37 and 38. And then finally, the writings of the scriptures in verses 39 to 47. All of that witness, all of that evidence, how hard-hearted do you have to be to just reject out of hand all this evidence? You know, think about it for a moment. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 says to us that creation is enough. That if all that we had was creation to testify to God, to testify of Jesus Christ, that's enough. And that because of creation, we are without excuse. The evidence of creation is enough. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, again, comes with mounting evidence for who he is. If you think about a, a trial, a courtroom, a court case, oftentimes it's the weight of the evidence that determines guilt or, or innocence, right? And you may not come in there with a videotape of the crime showing the accused doing it. You may not come in there with a smoking gun, so to speak, with the prints all over the gun, uh, you may not come in there with this silver bullet evidence, but it's going to be the weight of the evidence that determines innocent or guilt. And as you examine that for the jury, what do we ask for as a, uh, a standard, so to speak, for that? We ask for beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. We have mounting evidence. If you look at it the same way, it's by the weight of the evidence, all considered together, that determines innocent or guilt in a courtroom. Here we have evidence upon evidence upon evidence upon evidence of the truthfulness of the claims of Christ that if any reasonable person, any reasonable person would, upon the weight of the evidence, have to respond with belief. There have been many who've looked at the scripture that way and have come to that conclusion. There's just so much evidence, evidence upon evidence, miracles upon miracles, just proof from the word of God. And in any given courtroom, the weight of the evidence is abundantly, overabundantly sufficient to take the claims of Christ as true. We saw the witness of John beginning in verse 33, where the Bible says, you've sent to John, he's borne witness to the truth, yet I do not receive testimony for man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So here comes John the Baptist, as we talked about. According to Matthew 11, the greatest man born among women, first prophet of God in 400 years, the forerunner sent by God to bear witness to the light, and for a time, the Bible says, they were willing to rejoice in his light. He was the burning and shining lamp. Just as a lamp lights the path for people, John lit a path to Christ, and they rejected that testimony. So then he goes on to his second witness. Jesus brings in an even greater witness, the witness of his works. Verse 36 says, But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So as profound, as significant, as, and as believable as John's witness was, Jesus brings in a greater witness, and he's referring to his works, the miracles. He says, the very works that I do bear witness of me. They dismiss the, the testimony of the prophet. They then dismiss the miracles upon miracles upon miracles, attesting to the veracity of the Lord Jesus Christ claims Miracles attested to, in fact, even by his enemies, they believe them to be true. And this was done to point to the unquestionable truth that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. Those miracles designed to point to the truth of his claims. Miracles attesting to the truth of his words, attesting to his authority, attesting to his work as a Messiah. Now, someone might say, thinking about those miracles as evidence, what about miracles today? What about the miracles that we see done today. Interesting how Satan takes 
evidence like this, something that is good, something that is profitable, something that the Lord does for our good, and Satan corrupts it and counterfeits the truth. The miracles that Jesus did, the miracles that we see in the Bible, were intended to point to Christ, point people to Christ as the Son of God, someone sent from God with a power and authority to perform miracles. Miracles were meant to attest to the truth of God's word spoken by his messengers, his servants, meant to attest to the authority of apostolic preaching and teaching, apostolic writing. Miracles had the purpose, before we have the completed prophetic word made more sure, as Peter calls it, pointing to the truth of God's word, the truth of who Christ said that he was. Who do the miracles today that we see often point to? Yeah, themselves. The fanatic doing the miracle, right? Often points to themselves. Do they point people to Christ? Do they point people to the truth of God's word, to solid, sound doctrine from the scriptures? Do they point people to holy living? No, they often point to themselves. They point people to crazy false religion marked by unholy living and false doctrine. The miracles performed by Jesus were for the purpose of bearing witness to him. Jesus says here, the very works that I do bear witness of me. Listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, this is Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Talking to a crowd, you know it. You've seen the miracles. God attests to the Lord Jesus Christ by doing miracles, wonders, and signs. Before we had the Bible, before we had this prophetic word, as Peter says, made more sure, we had the word confirmed in the mouths of his messengers in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. Listen to this. The disciples, they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through the accompanying signs. That's God going with the messengers of God, attesting to the truth and veracity of scripture that was being spoken with the accompanying signs, the miracles that were done. Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 14, stay in Iconium. It says there, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness, again, all this, right, with a purpose of bearing witness, with a purpose of giving us evidence. It's not simply the miracle in and of itself to its own end. The miracle has a purpose, and its purpose is to bear witness to Christ, bear witness to his words. So here, speaking boldly in the Lord, the Lord was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders to be done by their hands. See the purpose of the miracle? Miracles were an attestation of apostolic authority, apostolic teaching, until we had the prophetic word made more sure. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It says, truly the signs, those are miracles works, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Miracles you see today often point to the person who is garnering a following to themselves often point to the hysteria that follows this sensationalistic kind of experience. Miracles you see today are nothing like the miracles that we see in the Bible, right? Lord Jesus Christ healing a man lame on his mat for 38 years. He says to rise and walk, take, take up his mat, and the man rises immediately. Today you go to a healing ra rally and it's healing Aunt Edna's gout, <laughs> you know, claiming to, you know, healing Uncle Ted's earache or backache or whatever ache. He's not restoring a withered hand. He's not giving a blind man his sight and it doesn't happen immediately most of the time. And then they blame another person's faith. Oftentimes, as we saw in John 5, there's no expectation of faith before the healing takes place. Miracles we see today are nothing like we see performed in the Bible. The only thing being attested to is crazy theology, really bad theology, one scandal after another, one fallen teacher after another, one guy extorting, fornicating, whatever, time and time and time again. In fact, the Bible warns us against believing the charismatic fake miracles that happen today. It says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders 
to deceive. They're done to deceive. It says they're, if possible, even the elect. And it's very interesting to consider the charismatic movement today. And think about it for just a moment. The miracles that we see. The miracles in the Bible were used again by God to attest to Christ and his word. And yet today, these so-called miracles that we see all the time, the so-called miracles, flourish in a charismatic movement that has very little regard for Christ and his word. Often marked by terrible theology, terrible Christology. Charismatic movement is ripe for this area because it's marked in large part by an abandonment of the word of God, not a cl- sticking closely to it. Abandoning sound doctrine from the scriptures. The charismatic movement today saturated, right, by what's in it for me. It's the whole basis, the foundation for the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. But if I believe in Christ, if I follow Christ, then I can be rich. I'm not going to be sick or I can overcome diseases. I'm going to be wealthy. I'm going to be good. I'm going to, my life's going to be good. I'm going to live my best life now, right? Word of faith teaching, word of faith nonsense. And all along, these guys, these false teachers, just garner a following to themselves, They seek to do miracles or seek to deceive with wonders and signs in the same exact way that Simon Magus sought to do it in Acts chapter 8. It's the same thing. Give me this power that I can deceive the peoples also. Reflects a complete ignorance of the truths of the Bible. And the the Bible says, God says, right, that you'll know them by their fruit. What kind of fruit do you see out of that movement? If you neglect God's word, if you neglect sound doctrine, that's what you should expect. You should expect that movement to produce those kinds of things. But if you neglect God's word and you neglect sound doctrine, you should expect that you could fall into that kind of heresy, that kind of deceit also. If you went home today, right? If you went home today and you took all of the garbage from your house over the last month, you, know, you just collected it all up, right? Messy job. Collect all the garbage in the, of your house for the last month and you just spread it all over your front yard. Just lay it out there, right? All over your front yard. What's that going to attract? Bugs, flies, all kinds of vermin, right? It's going to attract false teachers, I mean rats. It's going to attract all kinds of people who are vermin who don't care a thing about what they're eating, Right? You put garbage all over your front yard. That's what you should expect. That's why we've got to stick carefully, closely, meticulously, faithfully to the pure milk of the word, right? That we may grow thereby, not grow by garbage. All right, with all that now, we come to the next witness. The next witness, point three on your notes, is are the words of the Father. The witness of the Father. The Father himself... Jesus says in verse 37, who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. Now it begins with the fact that God the Father has testified of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is after his baptism in the river Jordan where you heard God's audible voice, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is before the Mount of Transfiguration, which they wouldn't have heard. But this is pointing to, because he uses a reference to his word in verse 38, and then again his word also in verse 39, what's most likely meant here by God's testimony is God's word they had in the Old Testament. So he's talking about his testimony of Christ from the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures and all that is there point to the Lord Jesus Christ. They give evidence, bear evidence of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in verse, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, there's a prophetic statement about the Lord Jesus Christ coming. We see the proto-evangelion in Genesis chapter 3. There's testimony there of Christ. Now to this, because they have disregarded this, this testimony, he adds to this statement three scathing rebukes, all right? Three scathing rebukes all three consequences of their hard-hearted unbelief. The first one that he says is that you've neither heard his voice at any time. This is a rebuke of the Pharisees who thought themselves to be obsessively religious, and yet in the Old Testament, Abraham heard the voice of God. 
Noah heard the voice of God. Moses heard the voice of God. Samuel heard the voice of God. Elijah heard the voice of God. And yet these have not heard the voice of God in any time. It's been barred. That testimony, that evidence has been barred from them because of their hard-hearted unbelief. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ is standing before them and they reject the voice of God in Jesus Christ. Him, whom he sent, it says in verse 38, him you don't believe. Second rebuke, Jesus says, nor have seen his form. You've never seen his form before. And you think about it in the Old Testament, Jacob saw a form of God. Joshua saw, saw a form of God. Moses saw a form of God. Isaiah saw a form of God. And yet that evidence, that testimony has been barred from them because of their hard-hearted unbelief. Here, Jesus Christ is standing before him and they do not see God in the Lord Jesus Christ because whom he sent him they have not believed. The third rebuke that he adds here. Verse 38 says there, but in your new King James, that word is the Greek word chi, better translated and. It's just the third of the three rebukes. And you do not have his word abiding in you. It's a rebuke, a consequence. Because, why do you not have God's word abiding you? Because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Jesus is the very word of God. We saw that in John chapter one, verse one, right? The greatest revelation of God is standing before them. The fullest, most complete revelation that God will ever give them is standing right there in front of their face and yet they have rejected the greatest and fullest revelation that God gives them of himself. Him whom he sent, him you do not believe. The word there, abiding, you do not have his word abiding in you, means remaining, staying. It's a part of who you are. It becomes just intrinsic to you and who you are and what you do. You do not have the word of God abiding, remaining in you. The statement implies that it has come to them that they received it and then since then has, have rejected it. It hasn't abided in them, has not remained in them. It's done them absolutely no good. No good because it hasn't remained in them. That's a warning for you and I, right? It's a warning that if you believe the word of God, that word should abide in you, should remain in you. It's like the Lord said to Joshua, this word of the Lord should not depart from your mouth. It means it's already in there and it should not depart. But you should meditate it, meditate on it day and night, observing to do all according to the, what is written in it. Got to obey it, got to observe it, got to meditate on it. Word of the Lord should abide in you. The evidence of the reality of these three rebukes is that they don't believe. They don't believe, and that gives evidence to the three rebukes that the Lord has already leveled against them. Otherwise, if they had believed God's testimony, they would have, not, would have acknowledged Christ for who he is. They would have seen him as the Messiah. But because they do not honor the Son, they do not honor the Father who sent him. Think about it this way. Brilliant doctor, right? Brilliant doctor, wise doctor, known all over the world for his expertise, comes in and he diagnoses you with a terrible disease. You're diagnosed with a terminal, deadly, terrible disease. But he lays out a treatment plan for you, a treatment plan that is gonna work. It's been attested to that it works. It's gonna work as long as you do it. And so the doctor then sends his son to, you see the analogy, right? The doctor sends his son to you and goes in with a treatment plan. So the son walks in the room with a treatment plan. He's about to start treatment for you. This treatment is going to work if you'll take it. And you say, who are you? Where's the doctor? Get the doctor in here. I want to talk to the doctor. The son says, no, the doctor has sent me. I've got the treatment plan. Look here, I've got your chart that the doctor filled out. Look, you can look at the bottom, that squiggly handwriting that no one can read. You know that's the doctor's handwriting. So take the treatment plan. Let's start it right now. Let's get you cured. But you won't do it because you don't trust in the doctor's son. The patient has had ample evidence, right? You've got the chart. You've got the son of the doctor. You've got the treatment plan. You've meticulously and faithfully scoured over that treatment plan. It's been attested that the treatment plan works. See it working all over the world. People getting cured from that terrible disease called sin. Got ample evidence. You've seen the chart filled out by the doctor. You've read the treatment plan. What's the problem here? What's the problem? Is the problem the evidence? 
Is the problem the testimony of the doctor, the testimony of the son? No, the problem is the patient. The problem is the wicked, terminally ill heart of the patient who rejects the doctor and rejects the doctor's son. Is it that the, the treatment plan is somehow not compelling enough? No, it's the, the, it's the greatest story ever told. It's the most compelling story imaginable. Is it lacking sufficient testimony? No, we see the testimony of God's people, the testimony of his word. The problem is, is the patient, despite all evidence to the contrary, the patient simply won't believe, will not submit himself to the doctor, will not submit himself to the treatment plan. I don't want to, listen, I play golf on Wednesdays. I can't come for a treatment on Wednesdays. Sorry. You know, I've got this or that thing to do. Besides, you know, if I have to do this treatment plan, I got to cut out all those things I really love. You know, I love to do those things and I don't want to have to give that up. <laughs> I'd rather die in your sin, you know, die in your disease than take the treatment. The problem is with the person. The problem is with the patient. They don't believe. What other conclusion can you possibly come to than simply that they don't believe? They just don't believe. You have a terrible, you have a terrible disease called sin, a terminal disease called sin. The treatment plan has been laid out. The doctor in grace and compassion has taken the time to condescend and treat you, willing to treat you. He's not willing that you should die, not willing that any one of you should perish, takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, desires that you, you, you are saved wants people to be saved, sent Christ into the world for the purpose of saving sinners, to seek and to save that which is lost. Take your medicine. Take your medicine. Aren't you sick and tired of living under the weight of that disease? Isn't it difficult to be the, the serial adulterer, addicted to pornography, adulterous, lying, Lie after lie after lie. The drunkard, the drug addict, the unfaithful spouse lying to your wife, angry all the time, angry with your wife, angry with your kids, angry with coworkers, angry with yourself, angry with God, angry with life in general because life, life of the sinner is hard. Way of the sinner is hard. Aren't you sick and tired of it? The Lord will take all that weight completely off your shoulders. Remember the uh, book, Pilgrim's Progress. You see the image of Christian walking around with a great backpack, you know, the great pack on his back and all that representing his sin. This great pack. It's interesting that there, Christian's the only one with one. No one else realizes their sin. But Christian realizes his sin, realizes the condition that he's in, realizes the freedom that he is missing He's got that great weight of sin on his back and bearing the burden of it. Now, some of you here today, uh, you're not burdened by your sin. You need to cry out to God because that condition will lead you to hell. Cry out to God that he shows you your sin. God, show me more of myself. Show me more of myself. Show me my sin. So that, God, then you can show me more of you. Show me who Christ is. Show me the excellencies of your kingdom, your glory, your salvation. The way of the sinner is hard. But the Lord says, he will, if you will turn to him, you'll turn from your sin and you'll turn, put your trust in Christ, live for him, that he'll cleanse you, he'll wash you, forgive you of all that despicable sin, will place your feet on solid ground, accepted in the beloved, a child of the kingdom with just a glorious inheritance waiting for you? The way of the sinner is hard. Maybe you're here today and you've grown up in churches that don't faithfully preach the gospel, don't faithfully preach God's word. And so God to you is the God of easy believism that'll let you live any way you want to live. On the authority of God's word, that's a lie. On the authority of God's word, that will send you to hell. Maybe your God is the Catholic God that you can live it up on Saturday night as long as you go through a couple of religious motions on a Sunday morning, rub a few beads, pray a couple of prayers, go to confession, take mass, and you're okay. Maybe your God is the God of works righteousness. You think somehow you're gonna clean up your own act. 
that you're seeking to establish your own goodness and in that you miss out on the goodness that is supplied to you in the Lord Jesus Christ if you'll turn from your sin, turn from your own filthy righteousness to him by faith, trusting him alone. Maybe your God is the God of charismania. You're just looking for the next spiritual high, the next emotional, sensational experience and somehow you think that that makes you right with God. Maybe your God is the God of antinomianism or you think somehow that you can just live the way that you want to live and things are just going to work out at the end. They don't work out in the end. If God's word is God's word, then it is true completely through and through. We can take it to the bank and God's word says, it's not how it works. Truth doesn't come from within you. You don't have a corner on truth. It doesn't matter what you believe. Who made you the arbiter of truth? How do you think your belief, what, where's that belief gonna get you when you die? It's gonna get you nowhere but hell. You're not the source of truth. You're not the center of the universe. And so stop believing the lie was, I believe this and I believe that. It doesn't matter what you believe. If God's word is the source of truth, then believe that because it is true. Fourthly and quickly, we see the writings of the scripture. The writings of the scriptures attest to who Jesus Christ is. Verse 39 says, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. But he says, verse 40, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Verse 39 implies great diligence. The rabbis, the scribes, the Pharisees scoured over the scriptures. They scoured over them. However, that study, that scouring, that intense diligence didn't provoke them to worship didn't provoke their affections for the Lord Jesus Christ, passion for the Lord. They're lost, searching and not finding, seeing and yet not perceiving. And many scholars, many liberals, many people study the Bible just the same way. So if you think about a man standing in front of a window, right? Sitting in front of this, this huge window, overlooking this glorious scene. Maybe he's in Austria, right? And he's looking out at the mountains. It's this glorious mountain range, snow-capped peaks, you know? Um, beautiful, just snow-covered, tree-covered mountains. You look down in the valley below, there's this beautiful river that, that winds through the valley. Little town, you know, nestled up against the river with, you know, these tile roofs and the smoke coming out of the chimneys. You know, kids playing over here. You got people skiing over here, you know, breaking legs. And you got um, just beautiful picturesque scene. You know, the sun just dipping below the, the edge of the mountains when sort of daylight turns to dusk. Beautiful picturesque scene. Another guy walks up, stands next to him, and he's like, Wow! Wow, look at that window. That's, that's gotta be the best window I've ever seen. Look at how clear it is. There's not a single smudge on it. What are they, they, they must have polished that this morning, you know? I'd really like to know what the chemical composition of that window is. Look at how clear, how they get it that clear. And that really is pretty astounding. And look at the frame. Well, you can't even see the, you know, the cuts in the wood. It caulked over real nicely. Look how decorative it is. Check out the window treatments. You know, who did those? Really, really nice. You see the, the difference? A window, God's word, God's word is a window to his revelation. The type and text, which is all very important in God's word, reveals something. And it's the revelation that has the Christian enamored, has the Christian with great affection in their heart for Christ. It's the, it's the, the revelation that is the thing that is pure, converting the soul. Does that all mean that we shouldn't examine all the details and be concerned about the details? No. Now we should scour, we even more should scour over the scriptures the way a legalistic Pharisee did. But separating ourselves from the manner in which they did it, we should scour the scriptures because the scriptures reveal Christ, reveal God. It's a, a glorious picture. That man just sees, but he doesn't see, he doesn't get it. The Christian loves the word of God. Loves the word of God because of what it reveals and what it does. Listen to a believer's testimony of the abiding word of God. Psalm chapter one, verse two says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. And if you love it, he says, it is your meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. They're words of salvation, right? Words of glory, words of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. 
Psalm 119, verse 167, my soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. Job 23, 12, I have tre treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That's, those aren't just platitudes. That's a Christian's love for the word of God. Word of God, if you feel that way about the word of God, the word of God will abide in you. To what degree do you not feel that way about the word of God? Or to what degree do you see evidence that the word of God is not abiding in you? You need to cultivate in your heart a love for the word of God this way. In addition to you cultivating a love for the word of God in this way, cry out to God to give it to you. Reveal himself to you on the pages of scripture. It is living and active. He'll do it. But you've got to cultivate a love for the word of God. You know, despite all of these witnesses, the word of God, John's witness, the witness of the Lord's works, the witness of the Father, despite these witnesses, verse 40 hands down the verdict but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. They weren't willing. Verse 44 gives the, motiv the motive. They want the praise of men more than the praise of God. But it's also that this wasn't the evidence they were looking for. The Pharisees at this point were looking for the Messiah to ride in on a stallion, kill off all the Roman opposition and set up his throne and make Pharisees the rulers. That's what they were expecting. They were expecting a conquering king. They weren't expecting or weren't looking for a suffering servant. There's a reason that he had to suffer. And that's so that you and I could be saved. So that he could pay the penalty for sin that you and I rightly deserve to pay. And he would take that upon himself on the cross. The third reason that they weren't willing is because they were trying to establish their own righteousness. They weren't willing to say that what they were was abysmally wicked. They weren't willing to confess and acknowledge their condition that they were enemies of God because of their wicked works, that they rebelled against them. They just didn't see themselves as that bad and God's not that mad. And Romans 10.3 says, for being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, they've not submitted to the righteousness of God. All the presentation of the evidence here that the Lord gives us in John chapter 5 ends in this warning. You're not willing to come to me that you may have life. So self-righteous, right? So stubborn, so ignorant. What is your reason that you won't come to him and have life? What's your reason? Verse 41, Jesus says, I don't receive honor from men. They were acting in their own self-interest, but not Jesus. 42, Jesus says, as a result of all this rejection, I know you, you don't have the love of God in you. Verse 43, I've come in my father's name and you don't receive me. Listen, you'll receive any other false teacher that walks in the door. Amazing how many times you're standing at the door witnessing, you're talking to someone about the Lord and you show them from the Bible why that guy's preaching a false gospel and yet they refuse to come to the Lord on the testimony of his word. They will stay with that fault. He's so nice. You know, he held my hand one time when I was sick. Such a nice guy. And yet, that's that false teacher. Doesn't the Bible say that Satan's demons often masquerade themselves as angels of light? Of course they're nice. Verse 44, how can you believe you who receive honor from one another do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Back at that time, they would teach and write and in teaching and writing would garner followers to themselves. They would seek, get followers to themselves. Another guy would teach and write, would get followers to himself, and those two camps would argue to try to get more followers to themselves. They were interested in the honor they could get from the people, praise of men, but they weren't interested in the honor that comes from the only God. And lastly, another rebuke. Verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus says, don't think that I accuse you. Moses, the one in whom you trust, he is the one who accuses you. They had all their trust in Moses, all their trust in the law, believing that if they meticulously kept the law, they'd be saved. The law doesn't save. The law condemns. The very thing that they trusted in, the very thing that in, in which they had all their hope is the very thing, ironically, that condemns them. The only hope that you have is Jesus Christ. The law was given to point us to Christ. You can't clean up your act. You can't be a good person and think you're gonna get into heaven. Your goodness is as a filthy rag to God. That's what it says in Isaiah 64. The law here, if it doesn't point you to Christ, it will condemn you to hell. 
Unbelief can never be justified by a lack of evidence. We have a tremendous amount of evidence to believe, amen? For the Christian, this evidence should steal you in your commitment to the Lord. Be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know on the a testimony of who Jesus Christ is that our work in the Lord is not in vain, amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us to live in light of this truth for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.